Hello, everyone. Let me begin by welcoming everyone to the first Joint Service Academy Cybersecurity Summit virtual experience with Palo Alto Network's President Amit Singh, Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy, Lieutenant General Jay Silveria, and distinguished representatives from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. I hope you and your loved ones are all staying safe and healthy. I'm John Davis, Vice President of Public Sector at Palo Alto Networks, and I have just a few administrative items before we begin. First of all, all participants with the exception of our speakers will be muted throughout the session. The session is being recorded and will make it available on the JSAC website following the event. You may submit real-time questions by using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom window. We'll be leaving plenty of time for questions during the second half of the session and we'll do our as best as we can to get to as many people as possible. Although I don't think we're in contention to rival Tiger King for ratings, we do expect almost 400 participants in our session, so please try to keep the questions brief to allow others the chance to participate as well. We thank you all for joining, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the President of Palo Alto Networks, Amit Singh. Thanks, General Davis, and welcome everyone. It's uh... It's a delight to be here. Uh, would have much appreciated doing it like we did uh, last year, uh, uh, where we met in person at the Air Force Academy. Uh, but you know, this is the new normal, isn't it? Uh, don't be surprised if my kids walk through asking for some food. I might have to put you all on pause or complaining that the bandwidth is too slow. Uh, that's a daily occurrence in the Singh household. Um, and you know what, it's a measure of uh, the extraordinary times we live in, where everything from learning to government to business, small and large, has moved online, working from home, so that we can try and uh, flatten the curve and do our parts. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, these also are times where, you know, we're seeing a uh, tremendous increase in cyber attacks, as many of us will discuss later on. Uh, everything from phishing to uh, large-scale bot attacks around the world and also ransomware compromises dramatically up. And so this is actually a very opportune time for us to come together and discuss the important work that all of you are involved in, uh, starting with uh, the Solarium Commissioners, and the Congressman Mike Gallagher, who leads the commission, uh, folks who are on, on the video conference here, um, Chris Inglis, Suzanne Spaulding, and Frank Stolufo. Um, frankly, you know, doing the work of getting our nation prepared in, you know, to handle cybersecurity at scale and having programs, education, and otherwise to get ourselves on the front foot as we defend not just our nation, frankly, also our students. And, uh, you know, that's why this partnership, private-public partnership between the joint academies and private companies like ourselves is so vital so that we can take the best practices and try and apply them, train our students and cadets who are coming out to become first responders on this fight. Because unfortunately, we, you know, this is the new normal, you know, working online, working from home, everybody connected uh, will come in waves, but, you know, in our judgment, will be much more normal than not. And, uh, you know, we believe that, you know, examples like the Internet 2 Technology Consortium across universities and K through 12 and campuses, which is delivering remote learning secure remote learning is such an important initiative. And, you know, we look forward to doing much more of that with the participants that are here. Um, I actually will give you a quick example of a university that, um, you know, uh, MIT, that has always done a lot of online learning, but ended up having to move all their students within 36 hours, you know, send them back home and try and get everybody working from home and now that's obviously standard my kids go to michigan uh, they're both home upstairs and doing learning and trying to find a way through all of this so providing secure learning environments uh, that try and 
um, both teach but also keep our people safe is incredibly important. We have almost 400 people like General Davis was talking about. So very, very thrilled to have all of you. And just a quick um, update on the you know, JSAC exchange. You know, we've been working, this is our sixth year, if I remember correctly, uh, General Davis, of doing these cybersecurity symposiums, partnering with um, the different academies uh, as a way of, frankly, bringing the community uh, together and sharing best practices. And, um, you know, we've, we've uh, had a lot of fun doing it. It's been a great experience for our company. And frankly, it's more importantly, it's been a great experience for the cadets that are online and trying to learn and be part of this community. So with that, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining and uh, would like to turn it over uh, to Lef Lieutenant General Severia for opening remarks. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And as always, uh, the work of uh, Palo Alto Networks to, uh, to continue to support that and, and make the investment in this uh, for uh, as we advance, as you say, all of our capability and all of our understanding. So, so thank you uh, for what Palo Alto uh, Networks does for, uh, for so much uh, for this community. Uh, I, I, uh, it's, it's, uh, everything seems to be happening at such a rapid pace for us that uh, for, as you were speaking, for me to reflect on uh, a few of things that we've experienced as we went from 0% online to 100% online uh, and at our own institution with 4,000 students. And uh, this past weekend, we, uh, perhaps the first one in the country, executed a, a streamed a, uh, a graduation uh, event that 270,000 people watched. Uh, so uh, we had some challenges, but what some of you may not know is the day before that, uh, it's tradition for us to commission our lieutenants the day before, which we did, uh, but in 40 different events that were probably viewed by, you know, ranging from uh, three to 500 people uh, each. So we, we had a very uh, a quick learning curve ourselves on, on how to execute those and, 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 and take advantage of, of all of that capacity. Uh, uh, greetings to all on the on this community. Uh, certainly represents the uniqueness of the JSAC community, which is probably uh, the only place where uh, industry and government and uh, and cyber leaders and government uh, agencies, as well as military, can can all come together uh, to begin to take on some of the toughest problems in cybersecurity. It's such a unique gathering. So, uh, um, I, you know, we, we are looking forward. We're disappointed that we're not all here in place in April, but we are, we are committed to uh, next year. Uh, we will get a date in April for April of 21 to bring everyone back to the Air Force Academy for a live uh, JSAC event. Um, we certainly, as Ahmed pointed out, in uh, the, uh, the unprecedented times, but, you know, challenges like this and forcing an institution like ours to, to react like we did you know, just gives us so much opportunity. And, and we're seeing in so many of the platforms and so many of the ways of learning and working and distributing information, uh, we're certainly seeing an, an amazing amount of opportunity that's right in front of us. Uh, this is the first time in history that we've had this kind of remote and online, and, uh, and we're learning a great deal, but uh, I, I, I'm convinced we're going to take advantage of that. Uh, certainly the Solarium Commission, you've been working diligently for a year and uh, uh, we've, uh, over the past six years, we're trying to create a summit that, that continues to have that cross section across industry, government, higher ed, military uh, in, a, in a unique, unique location. So uh, we'd like to continue to, uh, to be the, to be, to have that opportunity to have this relationship uh, both with Palo Alto Networks and, uh, and with this entire community. Uh, Colonel Caswell uh, from our team, uh, as you know, at, at the Air Force Academy uh, is one who's consistently in the computer science department here uh, organizing uh, this. So thanks to all of them for, for that work and, and the connection uh, with the commission. And we look forward to remaining a, 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 an important part of this uh, uh, for, uh, for Ahmed. So, so thank you very much and, and thanks to all for being here. A uh, unique opportunity for me to, to turn the floor over to uh, Congressman uh, uh, Gallagher, along with uh, with others, and I'll let uh, I'll let them introduce who is uh, who is there with the uh, for that discussion. But uh, 
Uh, thanks to all, and I look forward to seeing all of you in April next year. And uh, Congressman uh, Gallagher, please, uh, over to you, sir. Great. Uh, thank you, General, for being part of this. And thanks to everybody at Palo Alto Networks, uh, not only for putting this together, but for hosting me on numerous occasions for uh, engaging so early and in depth with the staff of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Your contributions were invaluable. Uh, I think it's fair to say that when we started this process over a year ago, and you know, we very much anticipated and planned for a, a rollout of our final report, we did not intend for that to happen in the midst of a pandemic, uh, which has created some problems in terms of our hearing schedule, our whole plan for uh, effectuating some of our recommendations into legislation. But nonetheless, I think, as we've thought about in the last few weeks, I think there are a lot of areas in which um, the experience of the last month in dealing with coronavirus uh, enhances some of the issues that we are talking about in the report, and I hope we get an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. I'll just provide a, a broad overview of the genesis of the commission itself, and then uh, our strategy of layered cyber deterrence, and then I'll pass it off to the far more, uh, the far smarter commissioners that are part of the Solarium effort. So, you know, at the most basic level, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission grew out of a simple recognition which is that despite numerous criminal indictments, economic sanctions, the development of robust cyber and non-cyber mili uh, military capabilities, cyber attacks against the United States continue to proliferate. And why is that? Well, uh, we believe that perpetrators in cyber saw that their repeated attempts to damage the United States happened without triggering significant retaliation. We've made significant problems and uh, uh, progress in the last three years. However, bad actors, both nation state and non-state, have and continue to use cyberspace to subvert American power, American security, and our American way of life. And it's our assessment that things are not getting any better. If, any, if anything, the threat landscape in cyber is getting more challenging. The more digital connections people make, the more data they exchange, the more opportunities our adversaries have to destroy private lives, disrupt critical infrastructure, and damage our economic and our democratic institutions. And so, to put it bluntly, we believe that deterrence is currently not working to stop our adversary actions in the gray zone, everything short of armed conflict. And so, in the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, the Armed Services Committee chartered the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission to address this challenge and really explore the question of whether deterrence is possible in cyberspace. The President and Congress asked the Commission to answer two fundamental questions. The first was, what strategic approach will defend the United States against cyber attacks of significant consequence? And the second was, what policies and legislation are required to implement such a strategy. And so in our report, which is available at solarium.gov, I know a lot of you need some uh, shutdown reading. You can get it online, it's right here. Please, I beg you, we spent a lot of time working on this, so please read it, we want your feedback. But in the report, the commission outlines a strategy of what we called layered cyber deterrence, which emphasizes national resilience, public-private uh, collaboration, and how we extend DOD's concept of defend forward, across the federal government. Our short-term goal with this strategy is to prevent or mitigate the effects of cyber attacks of significant consequence, and while our long-term goal is to create a digital environment that is safe and stable, that continues to promote uh, innovation and economic growth, that protects personal privacy and ensures national security. So to do that, we propose a three-step plan to reach those strategic objectives. The first is, shape behavior. How do we shape behavior in cyberspace? We must work with allies and partners to encourage restraint and promote responsible behavior in cyberspace. The second, the second layer of uh, layered cyber deterrence is a question of how we deny benefits. Denying benefits, securing critical networks in collaboration with the private sector to promote national resilience. Think of this as deterrence by denial. And then the third layer is, is kind of a transition to deterrence by uh, punishment. How do we impose costs on our adversaries? How do we maintain the capability, capacity, and credibility needed 
to retaliate against actors who target America in and through cyberspace. And so to support these three layers, these th three broad lines of effort, we outlined six pillars or six lines of effort rather and organized more than 75 policy and legislative recommendations. Just briefly, uh, the six pillars are reforming the government structure. While cyberspace has transformed the American economy and society, the fact is the federal government simply has not kept up. The second is strengthening norms and non-military tools. Nor how do we promote those norms of responsible behavior for cyberspace, which currently go largely unenforced? We believe we can, over time, uh, not only reestablish deterrence, but uh, reinforce or create, in some cases, and reinforce norms by using non-military tools, including law enforcement actions, sanctions, diplomacy, information sharing, um, in order to persuade our allies and even our competitors to abide by responsible norms in cyber. The third is promoting national resilience, which I mentioned before. We need to be sufficiently prepared to respond to and recover from an attack, to sustain our critical functions even under degraded conditions, and in some cases, restart critical functionality after disruption, right? Think of, thinking through the unthinkable now of a massive cyber attack, how do we get the economy back online so we can respond with speed and agility and strike back against whoever attacked us. The fourth is uh, reshaping the cyber ecosystem towards greater security, raising the baseline level of security across the cyber ecosystem. The fifth is operationalizing cybersecurity collaboration with the private sector. Uh, we recognize that private sector entities have the primary responsibility for the defense and security of their networks, but the US government has unique authorities, resources, and intelligence capabilities that it can bring to bear in order to support these private sector actors in their defensive efforts. And then finally, that fifth line of effort in layered cyber, or that sixth line of effort in layered cyber deterrence is preserving and employing the military instrument of power. Uh, future crises will almost certainly contain a cyber component. And in that environment, the United States needs to be able to defend forward to limit malign adversary behavior below that level of armed conflict, deterring greater conflict, and if necessary, prevailing in conflict by employing the full spectrum of our capabilities. So the bottom line is we believe the status quo, while we've made improvements in the last three years, is unacceptable. We need to change. Uh, and before I turn things over to Chris, Suzanne, and Frank, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about some of our proposed reforms to government structure. Since the US government is, you know, we all know famously flexible, adaptive, and can turn on a dime, I'm sure we'll have no problem effectuating all these recommendations. But starting at the top, we call for a Senate confirmed national cyber director in the White House. And the idea is that we need a specific and accountable individual who can bring strategic coherence to US cyber policy. Our model here, particularly since we call for a Senate confirmed position, is that uh, that model of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. We believe that the, the parallels hold because that's a functionally oriented office. It's composed of subject matter experts coordinating a government-wide strategy for what is inherently an interdisciplinary policy challenge. And that's exactly what we need in cyber. And I would argue that one of the executive branch's biggest obstacles to being effective in cyberspace has been consistency. And so we, we believe by having a Senate-confirmed uh, person in that job, we can create that consistency, and that will allow for a more productive oversight relationship between the legislative branch as part of a new uh, select committee on cyber and a national cyber director. Secondly, we call for dramatically elevating CISA uh, and its stature. It really tried to elevate and empower CISA in order to more accurately reflect its critical importance. And our vision is that you know, CISA really is given all the tools it needs to ensure national resilience of critical infrastructure, promote a more secure cyber ecosystem, and serve as that central hub for civilian cybersecurity authority to support federal, state, and local and, pri and private sector cybersecurity efforts. We have a variety of recommendations that enhance the leadership of CISA, the authorities of CISA, and CISA's ability to recruit the best and the brightest over there. And I would say over the long term, we want CISA to be able to compete for talent, not only with NSA and Cybercom, but with Google, Facebook, and dare I say, Palo Alto Networks. Um, and finally, we recommend substantial changes to the organization of Congress. I alluded to before, we're calling for the creation of a new House 
Permanent Select and Senate Select Committee on Cybersecurity to consolidate that budgetary and legislative jurisdiction over cybersecurity issues, as well as traditional oversight authority. These committees would not duplicate the oversight activities for our Title 10 and our Title 50 um, uh, committees, Armed Services Committee or Intel committees that are already in existence, but they would consider legislation, hold hearings, subpoena witnesses, consider nominations relevant to improving our public and private systemic cybersecurity. So that's just a few of 75 recommendations. It's a very ambitious agenda. We're currently working with the committees of jurisdiction to get as much at, uh, of this enacted into law as possible this legislative cycle. I'm heartened that even for uh, the original Project Solarium, you know, which we were modeled after, Eisenhower didn't just walk out of that day-long debate of the NSC with a master plan for how we confront the Soviet Union. It took months and years of refining a lot of initial ideas in order to arrive at a sustainable posture of containment. And similarly, I don't think any commissioner would suggest we've solved every problem under the sun but we hope, if nothing else, to have started a critical debate, not only among you know, the types of people that are on this call, but among the American people. And that's part of why we wrote an unclassified report. We tried to make it readable. We tried to eliminate as much jargon as possible. We opened with a fun, well, not fun, of a dystopian vignette about what the future would look like in the event of a massive cyber attack. We really just want to get people engaged in this discussion. So with that, I will turn it over, I believe, to Chris Inglis is next. Thank you, Congressman Gallagher, and um, so thanks for a great introduction. Uh, before I get started, I just want to clear the air. I've gotten about 10 messages uh, indicating that uh, it appears I'm growing a beard. That's not at all the case. I'm just a citizen trying to do my part. I'm growing an N95 mask. So far, I'm about N40, but I'm heading in the right direction. Um, having said that, I think my job, Suzanne and Frank's, in the uh, kind of uh, batting cleanup, is to walk through some details about the pillars. Congressman Gallagher gave a good uh, accounting of the strategy and then walked through some of the details of pillar one. I'm going to describe briefly pillar two. Suzanne and Frank will take other pillars and hopefully create some fodder for your questions. Uh, pillar two, as you recall, was to strengthen norms, global norms, and non-military instruments of power. I'm going to kind of uh, start with the non-military instruments of power and then talk a little bit about the norms. Uh, the non-military instruments of power are the ones that you would think about, uh, the legal instruments of power, the diplomatic instruments of power, the ability to create, sanction, incentivize, uh, bring consequences to financial markets. But the reason that that's a pillar in its own right is to Congress and Gallagher's uh, you know, point is that we believe that while the U.S. Defense Department has defined a concept known as defend forward, all the instruments of power that we bring to bear should defend forward. The key aspects of that being that we have early discernment of uh, aggressors acting in cyberspace. Um, we have early action on the part of the government and the private sector, and, and frankly, that should be governments plural um, to engage that, um, whether that's on their territory or, I, or ours, to engage that at the earliest possible moment and to achieve the highest possible leverage, not simply with the application of discrete instruments of power, but the combined application of those instruments such that we achieve a concurrent effect. Um, those instruments of power um, that, that we bring to bear, having been described, we have some specific actions that makes it more possible for us to effectively and efficiently apply them. The actions under this category include resourcing a new bureau within the State Department, led by an Assistant Secretary of Defense who will essentially tee up and make sure that we're very strong, muscular with respect to our diplomatic instrument of power. Uh, we strengthen collaboration with international law enforcement partners. We recommend that we more actively engage in international standards bodies where the U.S. has been um, absent, um, you know, strangely absent for the last few years, um, creating a vacuum within which entities like China have stepped in. We believe that we need to work with global partners to build capacity out. We need to have uh, confidence building measures um, and we need to greatly improve the attribution of malign actors in this space. There's a range of recommendations to that effect. And, and that's so that we actually have the attribution necessary to tee up and to sharply aim these instruments of power. Having said that, just briefly about the norms portion, um, there are well-established global norms, at least for like-minded nations, to include the United States, the United Kingdom, um, others um, of, of that ilk, uh, but they have not been uh, widely supported by all nations, and they've been largely unenforced. 
Um, so we believe that we should uh, not simply affirm those, but we should begin to um, affirm those through the um, application of consequences using the cyber deterrence strategy that was earlier described. Um, in this regard, um, our lack of will to engage, or frankly, our complacency over the last eight years, is something we call out that we have to begin to bring consequences to bear, whether they are incentives or punitive measures, we have to bring consequences to bear, such that we either reward or we punish the actions that take place in this space. In that regard, the commission affirms that we believe that while deterrence has not been working in cyberspace, we believe that it can. Um, having said all of that, we'll look forward to your questions. I'll turn it over to Suzanne for discussion of the next pillar. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I wanna start by noting uh, that, well, first I wanna start by thanking um, our hosts for this event and all of you who have taken the time to tune in. And I wanna thank particularly uh, Congressman Gallagher for <laughs> leadership of this commission. Uh, we were all really impressed with how uh, incredibly nonpartisan, not just bipartisan, but nonpartisan, our conversations and our work uh, was as we went forward and the tone was set at the top by our uh, bipartisan and bicameral leadership. So uh, Congressman Gallagher, thank you very much for that. Uh, we focused a lot on, on changing adversary, altering the, the adversary's calculus, right? The cost benefit analysis. So we talk about uh, imposing costs and denying benefits, really an, an important uh, underpinning for our recommendations. But I want to note that it also, our pillars also track very nicely with the traditional risk management approach, certainly that we uh, use at DHS and that I've uh, you know, been familiar with for, for decades as we've looked at the strengthening the security and the resilience of our nation's critical infrastructure against all hazards, including cyber. And so if you think about uh, risk as a factor of threat, vulnerability, and consequence, where you use those three to assess your risk and then mitigate against all three, and you look at our pillars, uh, you realize that what Chris has been talking about uh, is really about threat. The pillars around uh, norms and around uh, instruments of military power are about uh, assessing and addressing the threat our pillar around ecosystem is really about vulnerability. It's really about addressing, identifying and addressing vulnerabilities. And then the pillar on resilience is obviously about consequences, understanding and mitigating those consequences. The pillars around organization and particularly around operationalizing the public and private sector relationship cuts across all three of those. So I'm gonna focus particularly on the ecosystem and resilience and, and with regard to ecosystem, the important thing I think there to recognize is that we had a bias toward relying on market forces. Uh, I think there was a general agreement that the market is the most efficient, uh, effective way to address these issues and, uh, and drive the kind of behavior that you want. Uh, the market is not working right now. The market has failed. And so we looked at why, why might that be? Uh, why would the market? Um, be failing in this context. And, and one of the key areas uh, for making markets more efficient is information. And so we have a number of recommendations uh, in there about providing greater, more information to the public. Um, and that includes uh, uh, Cyber Bureau of Statistics, a, a, a recommendations around cyber insurance, uh, the creation of a certification and labeling authority so that you're providing information to consumers that, so that they can make more informed um, decisions. Uh, but, but we think that uh, getting information out into the marketplace is, is a critical part of making it more effective and efficient. Uh, at the end of the day, there are times and places where the market will never get you where you need to be. And um, that's primarily where there are externalities, right? That no single business or business itself should be asked to or will be able to accommodate or build into any kind of return on investment. Uh, and so there the government may have to step in, both with regard to assistance, and we've got a number of recommendations along those lines, but also in some instances with regulations and mandates. And so we do have some of those in the report as well. Resilience pillar is one that uh, I was particularly see, pleased to see the commission uh, really focus in on. I, um, I think 
we typically in our cybersecurity conversations spend so much time focused on threat and vulnerability and traditionally not nearly enough time thinking about consequences, uh, both in terms of prioritizing and assessing our risk. What are the real world consequences? This is not just about trying to protect networks. It's about trying to sustain the functions that those networks enable, right? And so understanding those real world consequences to business or to your mission and government uh, is, is a critical piece of this. And so we spend a fair amount of time on that and looking at how we uh, strengthen CISA as the national risk manager uh, for both the government and to assist the private sector in that regard. Um, that's a big part of what the continuity of the economy section is about, a really, really important concept that Samantha Ravitch from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy has really brought to the commission uh, and a lot of recommendations, uh, as the Congressman mentioned, around how we assess and really focus on those functions that are essential for our economy. And we're getting a really good view of that as we think about uh, the impact of the coronavirus, obviously, and as we think about how we move forward. Um, but, but those lessons will be applicable to our uh, uh, cyber response and recovery from a massive cyber attack as well. Uh, and then the notion of a cyber state of distress, which gets at this gray zone area that the Congressman mentioned, um, where, where, where you haven't quite triggered, for example, the Stafford Act uh, level of state of emergency, um, but it's gone beyond the day-to-day -day annoyance to do something that is significant and, and, and where we need to rally and uh, our, our resources are mobilized to address. And so that would be a cyber state of distress, which would trigger a uh, response and recovery fund. Um, a key area of resilience that, again, I thought was particularly important, we, we did spend several pages talking about elections uh, and the role that resilience plays in uh, the protection of the integrity of our elections. Recommendations around the elect uh, the EAC, the Election Assistance Commission, strengthening that with consistent funding and support, and also a recommendation for a cybersecurity commissioner um, passing legislation to both provide resources that are necessary for the states with a kind of matching grant, uh, but also recognizing the importance of things like paper ballots and audit trails. And then finally, around disinformation, one of the things that I uh, care personally really deeply about. Um, the importance of recognizing that all of the things that we're going to do to counter disinformation, one of the most important will be building public resilience against efforts to undermine trust and confidence in democratic institutions. And that means reinvigorating civic education and civic engagement. I think it is a national security imperative that we do so. And with that, I'll pass it on to Frank. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and, and, and thank you to everyone for allowing us to, to share some of our very uh, high-level thoughts on, on, on what the Commission has, uh, has put forward. Uh, I thought I'd focus uh, in zero in on Pillar 6, which uh, is preserving and employing the military instrument of power. And, and, and I think before I jump into some of the, the findings and recommendations, I think that the strategic element of our report is actually really important to look at mentality. So we resisted the typical DC urge to just jump to rearranging deck chairs and, and looking at new boxes in org charts or how to make uh, existing boxes in org charts better. We, we really did see the need to have a, a, a strategic approach and underpinning principles based on these pillars to, 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 to bring all of these elements and elements of power together. So if you were to look at the very initial uh, language around the creation of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, it, it would have led someone to think that we're going to, to focus, uh, uh, if not exclusively, primarily on some of the military instruments. And, and, and it's not to suggest that they don't matter. They actually really do but they are most effective when used in concert with other means and other instrumentalities and, 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 and all elements of power. So uh, it, it's not to belabor the point, but we do need to see deterrence in its strategic prism and not the individual lenses uh, many of us have uh, thus far. That said, 
we're never going to simply be able to firewall our way out of the problem. Uh, the reality is, is uh, we can't simply defend. We need to uh, ensure that our defenses are up to snuff. Um, but this is a bit of a red-blue set of issues. We need to make sure that we have the, the, the offensive capabilities to dissuade, deter, and if we need to compel uh, malicious behavior in cyberspace. And I think, uh, as Congressman Gallagher rightly said, and, and my colleagues uh, Chris and Suzanne both touched on in, in, in one way or another, the status quo just ain't cutting it. The reality is, is we've sort of let the adversaries define our strategy because it's our response that is defining where we want to go rather the, than, than the other way around. So I think uh, uh, ensuring that the, that the military instrument uh, is used and used in concert with other means, and, and we did define um, defend forward in a more broad setting than the initial government definition, which came out of the 2018 Department of Defense uh, cyber strategy. We are very much looking at it uh, through through uh, all instruments of statecraft, but to, to to be able to actually, we came up with two primary uh, sets of recommendations and, and and dozens of enabling recommendations around those. Uh, the first is directing the Department of Defense to create a uh, major force program, um, and uh, uh, to look at force structure and assessment uh, and specifically around the cyber mission force. Since uh, uh, the, the current force structure came out of 2013, which uh, uh, obviously is a, is a bit dated and it's not to suggest that we, we don't have the capacities and wherewithal we need, but clearly they need to be, uh, to be updated and, uh, and, and we had argued that they need to be uh, elevated. Uh, this is something that we spent a bit of time looking at what those various uh, uh, what that could look like and are asking Congress to actually look at it um, and, and through a cyber posture review and then to look at that uh, continually quadrantally from there um, within that we saw the need to also uh, allow and enable US Cyber Command to, to ultimately implement uh, its element of defend forward, which is around the persistent engagement sets of issues. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I think I can speak for the commission that uh, some recent activities and the, the run up to the midterm elections uh, and the alleged activities around some, uh, um, some response to hostile Iranian activity, US Cybercom is leaning a bit forward. And, uh, and, and, and to be able to do that, we recognize the need to do the daily uh, uh, tackling and grappling uh, around persistent engagement sets of issues. Um, and, and again, in, in isolation, not necessarily uh, most effective, but in concert with other means uh, can, can actually get the outcomes we're, we're hoping to, to achieve. In so doing, uh, we did recognize the need to develop a more robust signaling strategy, since anyone who's uh, really examined uh, deterrence theory uh, uh, recognizes that uh, signaling is, is essential for, for uh, escalation management. Um, and, and we ultimately need to be doing that ahead, not in the midst of a crisis, because obviously that could lead to miscommunication of uh, one sort or another. Uh, we did look at reviewing uh, uh, authorities uh, for cyber operations, so um, uh, and, and, and ensuring that we look at the various uh, agencies and, and rules of engagement and under what circumstances. Uh, uh, we did not come down on a very hard solution on uh, the, the Title 10, Title 50 issue vis-a-vis -vis the National Security Agency and U.S. Cyber Command, but we did recognize that there are different elements uh, based on where we need to uh, uh, look, look, look forward in terms of some of those uh, um, issues directly. Um, let me just read off a couple because I could go on forever here, but um, uh, we did look at uh, uh, our ROEs. We did look at cooperating with allies and partners to defend forward. Uh, you'll note that there's great emphasis on working not only with our Five Eyes partners, but with others uh, um, in, in many of our recommendations. 
Um, we did uh, uh, try to come to what we think are some reporting metrics, the old adage, what gets measured gets done, but are we measuring what matters? And, and, and I think there are a whole host of uh, challenges here that we uh, uh, lay out. Um, we did suggest uh, an establishing a military cyber reserve um, and, and happy to get into that and, and in, in some detail afterwards. And then a couple around education, including a, a Title X professor uh, for, for cyber related issues. And let me just say the second key recommendation, and there are a number of enabling recommendations underneath that, is conducting a, a cybersecurity vulnerability assessment of all segments of uh, the NC3 uh, and LCC systems and, and basically continu continually assessing weapon system cyber vulnerabilities. There have been a number of GAO reports and other sorts of uh, studies that have obviously brought this to the fore. The defense industrial base uh, uh, is obviously uh, not only critical to uh, uh, our uh, uh, economic security, but to our direct national security. And we did come up with a, a, a few enabling recommendations to enhance our threat intelligence sharing, to uh, uh, require threat hunting teams on the DIB network, defense industrial based networks, and, 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 and other activities around that. Bottom line is, is uh, there were uh, 84 recommendations uh, that we put forward I think in isolation, they all make sense, but I really think it's important that we look at it strategically because the different elements do come together. And, and we spent a lot of time trying to get our deterrence argument just right. And I'm not sure it is just right, but uh, um, I, I think it is critical to how we perceive uh, um, some of these solutions going forward. So I'll stop at that, jump in on any uh, sorts of questions people have. And thank you again. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, as we move into the question and answer portion of the session, just a reminder, you can submit questions through the Q&A button on your Zoom screen down at the bottom. Uh, first question is for Congressman Gallagher. What have we learned from the pandemic crisis and response about so Solarium Commission report recommendations regarding a, in quotes, significant cyber event. Congressman, you're on mute, sir. There we go. You know, I bought one of these fancy microphones that glows and it confuses me. Um, insert joke about a Luddite being commissioner and chairman of a cyber commission. Um, so uh, one of, I think the most obvious thing is it, what we're trying to do in, this, in the Solarium Commission is to think through these issues prior to that cyber 9-11 event. How do you reform the government with a sense of urgency so as to avoid a catastrophic attack and avoid trying to ramp up the production of things that we're having to ramp up in the context of a pandemic. So I think at the broadest possible level, it reaffirms the idea of doing a commission prior to disaster. Uh, and I say that as someone who tomorrow is going to vote on the creation of a special uh, coronavirus commission in Congress to look back on how we got certain things wrong, how we failed to see that our supply chains or compromise. And I would say that's kind of the second biggest overlap that I see between the two. You know, for the last month, I've been trying to serve this function of helping my hospitals get supplies they need for testing, right? And what makes this very difficult, what makes this different in many ways than Freedom's Forge in World War II, is that so many single points of failure have infected our supply chain when it comes to medical devices, testing devices, and pharmaceuticals. And most of us were completely unaware of this prior to that crisis moment where we need these things. The same can be said of critical components in our defense industrial base, uh, 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 parts that we'll need for the future of the telecommunications industry, 5G in particular, a variety of components we need for secure cyber going forward. I think the pandemic, and it's the third thing I would point out, because so much of us are working from home, I mean, greetings from my unfinished basement here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it, 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 it sort of heightens the need for reliable and secure um, technology 
to, uh, to allow people to work in such an environment. And then fine, fourth and finally, I would just say, uh, I think this proves the need for something like a national cyber director, right? The importance of having that one person, that single belly button in the executive branch who's coordinating efforts across government so that you don't have to create an ad hoc task force. You know, you're not scrambling to find who are the right people we need in the room uh, after the crisis has already occurred. And so I think there are a lot of other things, a, a lot of ways in which our experience with coronavirus has uh, enhanced the need for a lot of what we're talking about in the uh, Solarium Commission. I probably left a few out, and so I would see whatever time I have left to my fellow commissioners. Okay, thanks, Congressman. Um, yeah, speed and agility so vital in, in particular in this domain, and that coordination function is just absolutely critical. Uh, the next question we have is for Chris Inglis. And Chris, I know you've, you've talked about deterrence uh, up front, but can you go a bit deeper on how deterrence can work in cyberspace? And how did the commission address the challenge of non-state actors like criminal organizations, as well as state use of non-state actors to do their bidding, like patriotic hackers uh, or surrogates? Yeah, so again, we rejected the notion that deterrence is not possible in any um, human endeavor, but, but especially in cyberspace. But it is different than uh, what you might have expected, say, in the nuclear age when deterrence was uh, so formally defined. Um, in the nuclear age, um, the game was to keep the weapon off the field. When a nuclear weapon showed up, you kind of at that moment decided you had lost. It was game over. It was offense dominant. Um, in the cyber age, it's, uh, si it's uh, offense persistent. Um, the offense is always around, whether that's a human error or whether that's a, an aggressive act taken by a malign actor, um, you know, you're gonna have to deal with this all day, every day. And, and we thought that the human condition hasn't changed much over a million years of evolution. Um, they are often incentivized. Um, they are often um, kind of prone to respond to consequences imposed for bad actions. And so we take advantage of that. Those are essentially built into how do you create the right incentives, as Suzanne talked about? How do you create market forces that naturally make it such that we think about security as a desired feature, a primary feature, one that we're rewarded with in terms of the resilience and robustness of the things we do with cyberspace? But for those actors that would still come at you, how do you impose consequences? Um, and if you think about then kind of creating security as a commodity in this space, the resilience and the robustness, that you build by design into all the components to include people right in cyberspace um, you essentially make it such that you're kind of buying into a commodity when you buy some slice of cyberspace um, you don't then think about security as an afterthought and you don't need to be um, jamie diamond and some huge financial concern to be able to afford a security shop because you bought the primary service, whatever that might be in cyberspace, cyber um, resilience and robustness as a commodity comes along for the ride. Um, so we think that if you apply all of these uh, talents, these authorities, this expertise, that we can actually create a resilient and robust ecosystem within which individuals, organizations, nation states can have confidence they can do what they must in that space. And the bottom line, as Frank indicated on this particular report, is that we hope that people don't cherry pick it. We hope that they don't say, well, I'll take a little bit of column A and maybe two things from column six. Um, this is meant to be horizontally as well integrated as perhaps vertically sharp pillar by pillar. Um, and that the bottom line premise of the report is that we're proposing that if an adversary in this space wants to beat one of us, they need to beat all of us. That we think constitutes effective deterrence. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, everybody in the public and private sectors have a role to play. And I think another line I saw from the report was all hands on the steering wheel. So everybody's got a role to play, even in the deterrence uh, aspect of this. Uh, for Frank uh, uh, Salufa, I have uh, another question here. How do you see the partnership between DOD and the Department of Homeland Security evolving to align within the contours of this report? Uh, thank you, John, and, and, and that is an excellent question. So it sort of tees off uh, precisely what Chris was just discussing, that it's uh, uh, all, and, and you had mentioned, all hands on the steering uh, wheel in this case, is, is most essential when it comes to marrying up three criteria, authority, accountability, and resources. 
Um, and, and they're basically uh, uh, three primary entities that I think we're talking about here. And granted, there's so many sub-entities, but, but at the end of the day, if we can figure out how to align and synchronize the Department of Defense, DHS, and FBI, I think we're going to get a, a good step of the way forward. And this is something Chris was addressing when he was deputy director at NSA, and, and Keith Alexander had this simple bubble chart, and Suzanne was working at through the, the, the DHS perspective of NSA, FBI, DHS. I, I think there's been some significant progress uh, in our government approach. I mean, we, I discussed very briefly uh, rules of engagement, roles and missions, and, and I think NSPM 13, which is enabled activity uh, uh, to, 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 to be able to look across the entire uh, government structure has made some legitimate progress uh, in, in cyber activity. But you have a new player uh, in, in, in this particular space at the National Security Agency. It's the Cybersecurity Directorate, uh, run currently by Ann Neuberger. And, and I, I, I'm not sure we're all in sync with uh, some of this thinking, but from my perch, um, what you can see is NSA powering CSD. So all the SIGINT capability that the National Security Agency can bring to this cyber challenge. The Cybersecurity Director, in turn, fueling CISA at the Department of Homeland Security, which we really do need to beef up, and, 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 and that is going to be the belly button. That's the center of gravity to work with the private sector, which is so critical in this, uh, in this challenge. And, and we spent a lot of time on that. We just haven't had a lot of time to discuss that here. Uh, and of course, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, because ultimately, those are the two entities that you have the chance now to bring something really unique and really valuable uh, to the uh, other civilian agencies who in turn can empower and enable the, the, the stakeholders they have to include our critical infrastructure owner operators, our uh, cyber threat companies such as Palo Alto Networks and others, um, and, and, and others in this space. So long-winded way of saying, um, I, I think that we tackled it in many different ways. And, and I think when all is said and done, getting that intelligence requirement setting, setting process down will help uh, uh, enable the, these various pieces. So DHS, DOD is at the crux of it. I just wouldn't under, I, I wouldn't forget FBI because ultimately with a lot of the non-state actors, um, uh, law enforcement is gonna play an integral and critical role. And let me just underscore one point uh, on deterrence. I mean, at the end of the day, we're not deterring cyber. We're deterring actors from engaging in malicious cyber activity. So what deters China may not deter Russia, may not dissuade Iran. So at the end of the day, we really need to take all of these strategies and personalize them to the, the, the actors that are uh, most front and center to us. So I've already gone on too long. I've never had that unspoken thought, but uh, I'll leave it there. Hey, thank you, Frank. That's an excellent point. Uh, next question is for Suzanne. Uh, this is from Dale Hetke. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Chief Operating Officer at National Cyber Center. Uh, he says, thanks for your words, Suzanne, in the elections realm. I agree there is much needed effort surrounding the resilience of public trust. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how to do that at a uh, grassroots level when it seems the public is constantly being bombarded with negative comments in this realm from some of the highest levels of government. Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, both in terms of the importance of this issue, but also your focus on the local level, uh, because I think that's uh, that's certainly where we're putting a lot of our effort and energy these days. The last three years in my role at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, I've been looking at how adversaries and particularly Russia uh, have been engaged in information operations to undermine public confidence in institutions well beyond elections. And we've been focused on the uh, propaganda efforts targeting public trust in the courts. And and I am very worried that we've got a potentially toxic brew uh, that is uh, mixing right now with COVID-19, 
uh, and elections where election officials are working hard to try to figure out how to accommodate uh, the need for uh, a, a process and elections that people have sufficient notice of and, and understand and address the public health concerns around the virus. And those decisions or lack thereof are winding up in the courts. Courts that are already uh, facing declining public trust and an increasing public sense that the courts are just political, that judges are just politicians who wear robes. Uh, and I do worry that the they're being pulled in further to very emotionally charged and political uh, decisions that they're going to have to make, that they'll be con courts will be confronted with in the coming months around the elections. And you add on top of that disinformation around the elections and around the courts, and you really create a situation in which you run the risk that the public will not accept the legitimacy of a court's decision or the outcome of an election. So I think it is there is a real sense of urgency, and I think it is going to fall a lot to community level leaders and to our politicians, obviously, and our pundits at the national level. I think folks need to be very careful about how they talk about court decisions with which they disagree. Uh, criticism may often be well placed, but folks need to understand that the, the land on which their comments land has been strew, uh, strewn with uh, comments delegitimizing de courts for many years. Some of those are coming from foreign adversaries and many of them are domestic voices. There are few trusted voices, uh, arbiters of fact, that the public trust anymore, and it's gonna to fall to local community voices. So we've been trying to activate a rapid response network of retired judges, former, former judges of lawyers, of law students, uh, who can speak to their community in ways that can be trusted. Uh, restoring that trust is gonna be vitally important. Thanks, Suzanne. I, I could hey, John, could I uh, could I add? Um, Absolutely. Commend enormously. Uh, commend the work that Suzanne and, and her uh, her colleagues have done in that regard, and fully support what she said. I would add a couple of things um, to that. Um, one, uh, there is a role for technology to play in terms of identifying who's who in the zoo, um, such that critical thinkers. That's another issue. Um, how do we actually develop critical thinkers from kindergarten on? Um, in a way that critical thinkers could then make up some uh, make up their minds based upon a proper attribution of who's saying what, whether there's some credibility or bona fides attributable to the uh, the person who's speaking at that moment in time. Um, and, and then finally, we need to perhaps make people aware of what's different about cyberspace than might exist in the physical um, world that we live in. Um, this disinhibition, all manner of things have been exacerbated or perhaps an altogether different um, experience in cyberspace. And, and we imagine that the digital natives who've been born and raised in the last 20 years understand the underpinnings of how this works. They're not actually digital natives, they're app natives. And, and we need to perhaps kind of give some greater time and attention um, to help them understand you know, what they see on the screen, what they experience as they enter cyberspace. Um, and what perhaps um, might be the reality behind that. So, so there's a strong educational component of that from the moment our kids hit school. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have another question. I've, I've just been told we're gonna go a little bit long. I don't know if everybody will be able to stay on, but uh, there's a lot of questions here. So we're gonna do our best to try to take this to, out to about 2.15 Eastern. Uh, if you can stay with us. This is a question from uh, the CEO of the Girl Scout, Sylvia Acevedo. Thanks for joining us, Sylvia. What efforts are being directed to add more security into IoT, the Internet of Things? Many of our IoT devices from business applications to building access do not have robust levels of security. Uh, perhaps we could start with uh, Suzanne and then anybody else who would like to jump in on that. Yeah, uh, terrific, great question, and uh, we did we did focus a lot on that. And that is, I would direct you particularly to the pillar on strengthening the cyber ecosystem. Uh, the idea there really was to think about all the ways in which we could uh, drive the market to put uh, safer, more secure products uh, uh, into the marketplace. And so, some again, some of those are going to be providing incentives. Uh, and some of those are going to be re providing requirements and regulations. So uh, 
certification and labeling authority. Both of those elements, the certification piece, which is looking at IoT devices uh, and assessing the key uh, aspects that would make them more secure and providing a level of certification and then a label that the public purchasers of those devices for the Internet of Things can have greater confidence and be able to assess their in their own risk assessment um, how much security they want to purchase, but at least they'll have information about what that includes. Moving toward the cloud, right, which is a key aspect and a, and a key uh, issue for small and medium-sized businesses particularly. And so certification that would help those purchasers of cloud services to know uh, how to evaluate uh, that, that particular cloud service in terms of its security. Recommendation 4.5.1 goes specifically to helping small and medium-sized businesses in that regard. Um, uh, you know, the uh, regulatory requirement on final goods assemblers, so those, those folks who are the last ones to assemble the various components and sell it to the consumer, uh, including businesses, um, our, uh, in our recommendation would be held liable for a failure to patch known vulnerabilities before those go out. Those are some of the ways we're addressing this concern. John, can I, can I jump in here and, and, and not just on the IoT, but I want to commend the Girl Scouts for their badges uh, focused around cybersecurity, because this picks up on a point that uh, Chris had just uh, discussed earlier. and. The K through 12 education component here is so critical. From a workforce standpoint, women, STEM, and cyber, that's a, that's a huge market we need to grow and we need to make sure we're uh, able to build out some of those capabilities. So I just want to applaud the Girl Scouts. Initiatives like those, they may seem soft and squishy, but the reality is they're so important. They're so important to... Uh, as a father of four daughters, they will look up to other women in that space more uh, quickly. But I think that these are the sorts of efforts we need more of. And uh, uh, I, I just want to just, just foot stomp that because a uh, huge proponent of that and, uh, and keep doing it. Thank you, Frank. And it was a real honor for Palo Alto Networks to be a partner with the Girl Scouts in that whole effort. Uh, anybody else want to weigh on this topic of IoT before I go on to the next question? I just would add uh, briefly that we're also recommending in the report, and Suzanne may have mentioned this, if I missed it, I apologize, the creation of specific cybersecurity centers to look at various topics, one of which is IoT, and then that would feed into this certification and labeling authority. And I think the recommendations that Suzanne laid out really kind of are a good example of this balance we tried to strike between wanting to incentivize the right behavior by the private sector without having an overly onerous one size fits all you must do x y z and so our hope is that over time this voluntary labeling and certification becomes an industry norm um and the final thing i'd say which i should have said in my initial remarks is which is implicit in all of this particularly when you have a commission with members of congress our schedules are crazy and so many distinguished people we had to rely heavily on our incredible staff. We had just a exceptional staff who really understand this issue of public-private collaboration. And so for anyone on the call who's interested in, in, in learning more about our report, uh, we have a repository of just incredible people that were working full-time to make our work as commissioners easier and to challenge our thinking. And so I just wanna thank our staff for the work they put in. Great point, Congressman. Um, we have a question here from retired Navy Captain and Director of the Massachusetts Cyber Center, Stephanie Helm. Uh, I guess we could start with Suzanne on this one uh, because it's getting back to the small business uh, question you were talking about before. Municipalities and small businesses find ransomware as a significant threat to their viability. This is a significant resource impact, either to prepare ahead of the attack or to recover post-attack Law enforcement seldom does more than file a report. So how does the Solarium help these smaller U.S. entities? Yep, so again, I would direct you to the ecosystem pillar and, uh, and there are a number of 
recommendations in there that are that are going to particularly help small and medium sized businesses. But there's a specific recommendation where we focused on providing incentives for small and medium sized businesses, um, particularly focused on taking up cloud uh, services. And again, we paired that with an effort to make sure that as they do that, that they are uh, that the cloud service providers that they are uh, moving toward. Um, are meeting certain basic standards uh, for security. So I think that's one really uh, key important part uh, of that. And then ransomware often comes in through those unpatched vulnerabilities and uh, the emphasis on uh, finding a someone to hold accountable for failure to put into place patches for non vulnerabilities uh, should help that problem as well. And I just want to add one minor point to this, General, if it's okay, because because this is also in, in our recommendations on enhancing CISA and empowering CISA, because a big piece of that is its support to uh, state, local, tribal, territorial, where they have a huge dilemma and challenge and, and quite honestly are, are, are not up to the capability any of us would like at this point to address ransomware and all sorts of uh, uh, other various uh, cyber activity uh, in, the, in the state local system, but also for small and medium sized business. And, and that is one of the reasons we really did really attempt to empower CISA, because it is in the right spot. We didn't always have authorities with resources and capabilities aligned, but that's the way once those are in alignment, we can actually get there. So there are some specific recommendations around small, medium sized business, but I, I don't want to forget the CISA piece that, to, to be empowered to provide those, those, uh, the, those, those capabilities. Thanks, Frank, and thanks, Susan. John, um, John, if I could just, John, sure. if I could just build on that, just to say that, um, think about the kind of spectrum of the recommendations that are in the report. All of those are designed to take on any specific issues. So in this case, we want to make it such that the ecosystem likely to be susceptible to that, that it's less likely that those vulnerabilities exist in the first place. We want to make it less likely that actors are kind of predisposed to want to take advantage of those vulnerabilities when they exist, that they understand that there will be consequences attended to that. And then left, I'm sorry, right of boom, when these things actually happen, we want to make it such that um, security becomes a commodity such that whether you're an individual or a very small organization, you can take advantage of security at scale because you're buying into that whenever you buy a service of some consequence. So those recommendations cover the gamut from well left of boom to well right of boom. Um, too often, I think in the past, we've tried to think about what do we do when it happens as opposed to how do we actually make it such that it does not happen in the first place. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we have a, uh, I love this one because it, we're getting back to the human element associated with all this. A uh, question from Marine Corps Officer Mike Larson. The Marine Corps, among other services, uh, has stood up a cyber force. However, talent management of the cyber warrior has been a retention challenge. What can the Corps and DOD at large do better, and I would argue even beyond DOD, to retain quality cyber talent? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Go ahead, Chris. No, I think there are going to be some financials associated with this to make it such that you have pay that's maybe not competitive with what you find in the private sector, but makes it such that you could kind of live a life of quality, raise a family, take care of your family. But, but more than anything, I think what we're going to have to do is to make sure that we value cyber, whether it's in the Marine Corps or any other entity, we value it such that we will invest in it across the career. We value it to the degree that we'll put you in a place where you can do meaningful work and we'll give you feedback about that meaningful work. Um, and you'll kind of, uh, you'll achieve a feeling about your work and your workplace that you believe you matter. And that is the biggest retention tool that any organization can bring to bear. Um, you know, we do this at the National Security Agency. Just about everybody on this screen has a similar problem. And we didn't ultimately solve these problems by essentially throwing money at it. We solved these problems by, at the earliest possible moment, connecting people to work that mattered and telling them as frequently as possible how they had, in fact, made that difference. Um, that's a to-die-for proposition. It's really hard to pull somebody away from that even with the lore of uh, greatly increased salary. Uh, did, did another commissioner want to weigh in on that? Uh, I think Frank did, and then I do after Frank. Okay, Frank, I think you're on mute. 
Oh, sorry about that. So uh, I, I think Chris answered that just right. But uh, but we did spend some time looking at ways to um, strengthen our scholarship for service programs and other educational uh, opportunities inside of our report. Because I mean, the workforce challenge is it's a big challenge, and 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 I think on the. Uh, whether it's DOD or whether it's civilian agencies or whether it's in the Title 50 IC community or whether it's uh, um, supporting our state, local, tribal, and territorial. I, I mean, the reality is, is this is a, a huge issue, but we did look at some uh, uh, efforts to, to enhance the SFS program. And I'll, I'll put on my, for the first time, uh, my War Eagle Auburn hat for a second here. We are we are 100% invested in our scholarship for service uh, uh, initiative where it basically funds people, it funds students, but they have a requirement to spend a couple of years inside the, inside a federal government agency uh, and the like. So we need to do more there. The truth is, is we have to get comfortable with the fact that people are going to go in and out of government. And that is something historically we have not appreciated I mean, at the end of the day, it is the mission. That's what matters most. But you don't always see how your role uh, helps in advancing our national interests or national security or our mission set. So I, I think you're going to see a point where people are spending time in government, out of government, bringing the skills they've learned from the private sector back to government, bringing some of the skills they've learned into the government to run a private sector more effectively through an intelligence-led initiative and the like. So I think the way we've thought about this has to change, but I think we also did zero in on a handful of initiatives that could try to fill that breach a little bit. Okay, thank you, Frank. And uh, Congressman, before we go to you to weigh in on that one, I know we're running near the end of our time, so I'd like you to finish your thoughts on that one, but I'm gonna save the last question for you as well. And that is, uh, we know Capitol Hill is focused on COVID relief and other pressing priorities, but how do you envision the recommendations laid out in the report gaining momentum in Congress, and can you give us a quick sense of what you expect in the near term? Yeah, so just quickly on the previous question, in the last two NDAAs, we have given the Pentagon enormous hiring flexibility and uh, enhanced resources to hire people with unique cyber skills. Some services have been more forward leaning in availing themselves of those authorities. Others have been more reticent. Uh, but I think you know, we, we would all agree that at the end of the day, as, as Frank said, as Chris said, we can help on salaries and things like that, but where we can outcompete the private sector is on mission, right? There's certain things you know, NSA and Cybercom offer someone uh, in terms of their ability to do interesting things that the private sector can't offer. And we hope over time CISA is, is the same way. I will say, however, uh, as someone who went through an abysmal TAPS process when I got out of the military, we think that's one area that we can improve in order to take people that have served in the military, and as Frank was alluding to, plug them into a civilian federal government cybersecurity job so they're not we're not losing that institutional knowledge, even if they're no longer wearing a uniform. And then, you know, Frank, I mentioned the scholarship for service. We're recommending a 20% increase in that budget next year, and then increasing the slots over a 10 year period from 300 to 2000. So we very much believe in that program. And then to your final question, um, listen, obviously there are uh, uh, hurdles we're going to have to, uh, get over that we didn't anticipate with Congress not, you know, physically being present, us not having a series of hearings. But that staff I mentioned, um, who uh, who's been incredible, is right now working with all of the subcommittees, all of the committees of jurisdiction. We are trying to make a big play in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, which even in the worst case scenario, as far as coronavirus precluding our ability to convene Congress, will still move forward in, in one way or another. And so we think there's probably about 30% of our recommendations that could be put into the NDA process. Some other recommendations don't fit within that and it will take some time. But uh, my co-chair, Senator Angus King and myself have for the last few months already been engaging with the committee chairs, the subcommittee chairs, whose approval we're gonna need in order to move these things forward. And so, you know, I would say even though coronavirus has complicated some of our committee rollout, 
our commission rollout, we're continuing the legislative process right now. And I'm pretty optimistic about our ability to shape at least this year's NDAA. And then one commissioner who's not with us today, who I think is just going to be pivotal, is my colleague, uh, Jim Langevin in the House, who is a subcommittee chair on the IETC committee, so the most cyber-focused committee under the Armed Services Committee. And he's been the biggest proponent, for example, of the reorganization of Congress, even though presumably he would be the most adversely affected in terms of having to give up his own jurisdiction and authority right now. So we have incredible advocates in Congress right now, like Jim, that are going to help us get um, uh, as many of our recommendations across the finish line. Probably not going to get 100% of them, but, you know, as someone who's sitting in front of a Bart Starr jersey and has, uh, has the Vince Lombardi biography on my bookshelf, the saying goes in Green Bay, you chase perfection and you catch excellence. So that's what we're hoping to do with uh, the final commission report and all of our recommendations. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, this was a fantastic session. And I'd like to thank uh, you and all the commissioners uh, and your staff, led by Mark Montgomery, as well as uh, Amit and General Severia for their leadership today. Uh, we also appreciate the commitment and tremendous support from all of our attendees, as always, and has been the case for six straight years of JSAC summits. Uh, as um, Amit and others have said, uh, we value these summits as a very unique venue for exchanging ideas and building trusted relationships between the public and private sectors to provide solutions to the challenges that our nation faces in the cyber domain. In the coming days, we'll be communicating additional virtual session opportunities on a variety of issues and subject matter. And Dave Kohlberg, he's listed as CSC Executive Director on your screen. He's going to remain online to answer other questions that haven't been answered. We thank you again. Please remain safe, healthy, and productive during this challenging time. Take care, everyone.